Like a lion's mane. <laughs> You're not funny. Get out. <laughs> I'm a jelly baby. It's going to be great. <laughs> I watch these back, why wouldn't I? And uh, the thing I often say to myself is, crack on. So, Mark Gatiss, oh, a temple of talent. Um, I mean that, known him sort of 20 years, a little bit, why am I going up at the end of my sentences? I'm not young, same. Uh, it's Mark Gatiss, League of Gentlemen, Sherlock, Doctor Who, and gallons and gallons of other stuff. I think he's there now. As George Michael said to Aretha Franklin, although I don't think he meant it, I know you're waiting for me. Da 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 da, Mark Gatiss. I have to share with the observer that we have just suffered some technical challenges um, as, as great as any. And I think when I die, Mark, and they, they look in to see cause of death, a big part of it will be the stress I suffered doing this podcast when the tech didn't work. Yes, well, you, were, you had a full head of jet black hair when we started this, as I remember now. I ran into you a few months ago at a rehearsal space, did I not? Uh, yes, yes, you were about to do the Sondheim, weren't you? Yeah, I was rehearsing this wonderful show, this tribute to Stephen Sondheim yeah. that Cameron McIntosh put on, which I, which I loved. And then you were in one of the other rehearsal rooms, I assumed preparing an acting role, but you weren't. No, I was directing Stephen Moffat's play The Unfriend, which is now transferring to the Criterion in London's glittering West End. OK, so let's just let's just take stock. Listen to you. <laughs> Knowing your background like I do, how much pleasure do you remember to allow yourself to enjoy when you say something like that? There's a lot, isn't there, to be said for taking time to enjoy things and just go, this is, this is a moment, this, you know, this is, um, remember, funnily enough, Stephen Moffat once uh, writing uh, a column for Doctor Who magazine in the, in the high pomp of David Tennant's time, when about just how many amazing things were happening. And he said, I'm kind of nostalgic for now. <laughs> and that's always stayed with me. It's, that's the sort of thing you need to sort of hang on to, isn't it? Because you, it's, it's only when they've stopped or you suddenly turn around and you're 78 and you go, oh my God, that was quite a moment, wasn't it? It reminded me, I did a play a few years ago, uh, Chorus of Disapproval, and Barry Rutter was in the cast, a uh, wonderful actor. And one day we were doing our warm-ups on the stage before the show. And I was moaning about how tired I was because my boys, who are now 14 and 11, would have been very young then. And... We weren't sleeping and da, da da And I was saying, of course, the thing is, in about X years, it'll be a lot easier. And he said, he's quite cross, stop wishing your bloody life away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, th I remember my mum saying that to me a lot when I was a kid. I, I was always in a hurry to grow up. I always wanted to be older and more experienced and sort of, I always wanted to get to the reunion. <laughs> <laughs> and... It's a, it's a, ter it's a, it's, it's a terrible thing. It's stupid, you know, because you, you know, the best of times is now. How, what are you drawn to? Because I, I've always thought that I've always been drawn more to experience than to youthful energy. I, I've often seemed to gravitate towards older performers yeah, yeah. rather than the, the, the young, energetic, challenging kind of people. My, my mum used to say I had an old soul. I used, uh, I really, I, I, I loved talking to old people from when I was very small. I loved it. I loved the idea of that connection to the past. I remember vividly um, talk, my, my girlfriend when I was 17 or 18, her grandfather was very old. And one, one afternoon, we were just talking. We were watching a film or something, just talking about something. And he was, he was from rural Yorkshire, very rural Yorkshire. And he remembered, just out of nowhere, he said, I remember this springtime, and, well, walk, walking in the field. And, uh, and suddenly, the commotion, a lad, a lad come running across the field, waving his hands. He says, hey, Titanic's gone down. And we just went, oh, it was just... Magic, you know, and you you can't you just can't imagine that gulf could be could be um, covered by one person. But there he was, you know. But now, equally, I think I did a film in the Outer Hebrides a couple of years ago with an almost entirely uh, a cast of almost entirely in their twenties, and 
they were so fantastically energized and busy. They were all writing things, all directing things. And I know this sounds vampiric <laughs> and vaguely sinister, but you absolutely, you do get something from that kind of energy. You do. It's, it's, it's good to stay around younger people because it, it reminds you of what you were like before you were ancient and jaded. <laughs> well, I'll tell you who in the public eye is the greatest vampire <laughs> in the in the nicest sense of the word. Yeah. Are you ready for this? <laughs> Go on. Sir Elton John. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Because he really, interestingly, he's been recording I mean, for as long as I can remember, with young, he's always been interested. He's never, he's not that one who says, oh, it's not like it was in my day. He feasts on, on the younger artists. I tell you, he used to be, of course, the greatest proponent of that as well was Barry Cryer, who was, yes. despite having done everything and worked for everyone, was constantly interested in going forward. And it's so unusual because, you know, everyone tends to become a bit, oh, it's not as good as it used to be. He was he had no truck with that, Barry. He was brilliant about it. He wanted to know what the next funny thing was. This thing I'm filming now for this beard is is a thing called My Lady Jane. It's uh, set in Tudor times. And um, a lot of young, very sexy young actors in that. And, you know, when we're sitting around the green room or the easy up waiting for a shot, I have been known to doze. Oh, yes, of course. Well, it's one of life's great pleasures, isn't it? I mean, well, it is now, but it wasn't always, no. and 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 with it comes a big red flag, <laughs> <laughs> saying if you if you think this dose is good, wait until the dose you're going to have right at the very end. <laughs> My grandma used to have a, an expression: "You're looking at the lid for a very long time." <laughs> I've never heard That's that. Good, isn't it? You. You, Reese Shearsmith, Steve Pemberton, and Jeremy Dyson, did you all meet at, at, at the same time, at the young age? Uh, yes, well, uh, Steve and I were in the same year at Bretton Hall in Yorkshire, and Reese was the year below, uh, and Jeremy was at Leeds University proper down the road. And how soon, how soon when you met did you, did you go... Yeah, these I'm I'm so in sync with these. Guys. I was with St Steve straight away. I mean, it was like the first day, and it was all we bonded completely over the total absurdity of the stuff we were doing, and, and we sort of realised we'd made a huge mistake coming. There. <laughs> but but it was a it's a bit, it's a brilliant thing as you know, isn't it? That sort of rapport when you realise you've all you've got such a sort of shared currency, and we all realised all four of us that we had all at the age of about nine or 10, um, not gone to a bonfire in order to stay in to watch Carry On Screaming. And it's, it's November the 5th, 1976. That's when, that was that night. We were all watching it at the same time. So in my head, we're sort of linked like that. You know? That's fantastic. <laughs> That's, no, that really is. So, so you met, you got together really early on with them and then famously, uh, the League of Gentlemen, and fr the way I look at it, that was a hit from the word go. Uh, well, yes, we well, we did it. So we did it on stage. Uh, it, was, it was basically a, a fringe act. Sorry, my dog. Shall I, shall I take my dog out or show him? I'd like you to show me your dog. This is Bob. <laughs> oh, hello. Oh, what's that, a Labrador? He's a Labrador, yes. Oh, I... Covered a Labrador. <laughs> you should get we, one. We spend our lives in turmoil saying, could we manage? Oh, look. at And his name is Bob. Bob, yes. Well, thank you for that. Thank yeah. you. What a lovely tribute. The Labrador for me and the Golden Retriever, I would say the king and queens yes. of the dog world. Yeah, actually, officially, they rule over the, the, the land of dogs. <laughs> but do they tie? Does Bob tie you and Ian down. You have children, so you know what that's like. As I, in a way, I can say this with not having children, but I imagine it's, it's similar, but there is less responsibility in terms of saying, we, are, we can do this, we just have to adjust to it. There's an incredible joy from having him in our lives. It is like, if you've ever thought about ruling a kingdom, it's like having a fool. It is like having a fool. <laughs> it is. I mean, he just, he does something every day to make you laugh. It is. And 
it really works. I mean, he's just, he's just lights up our lives. Reading, I'm reading up on you. I, I knew it anyway, but you really have followed your thing, haven't you? You know, you had this thing as a kid and you have explored that seam so beautifully well i mean you know a huge amount of it is dumb luck uh, but because it doesn't you know a lot of people think i'd like to do this and this is exactly what i'd like to do it doesn't happen but i i have mm. been very lucky in terms of the way that things have connected like that but i'm a i'm a great believer that the the child is father to the man and you you, you know you, you kind of go in a loop sometimes. You kind of go get away from some of your childhood interests and then you come back to them and they go, oh, yes, I remember this. I was an obsessive fossil collector. And for years, I didn't collect fossils. And then one day on a beach, I re remembered the, the incredible kind of peace and joy it gives me just spending hours on a cliff edge. <laughs> and it also, in a way, it takes you back to a simpler time, doesn't it, you know? Right. Tom Baker tells a very famous story about um, passing a homeless guy in the street and he was just walking past and he heard this man saying, got any spare change? And he was just passing by and then the voice just went, doctor. And he looked this man in the face and he said he could just see in his eyes that for a moment he was, he was having beans on toast in front of the TV with his mum, And he said, get us out of here, doctor. Oh, God, I know. And, and I'll, I'll bet Tom Baker didn't. What a dream. I know. He didn't have his notice with him. You'd done, you'd done more theatre than I realised. I knew you'd done theatre, but then when, when I looked at it, and you've also done, and this will sound like I'm blowing what's it up your what's it, but I would say you, 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 you reek of quality, Mark Gatiss. Uh, you've, you've done some lovely lovely interesting work well i've just i just done mission impossible well do you, do you think i wasn't going to do <laughs> which with uh, i've done i did a week on it last year and, and a month this year and probably yeah. more because it's basically a, an ongoing rolling film <laughs> it never seems to stop tell me the whole mission impossible story and the mark gatiss involvement from the minute the email pinged into your inbox oh uh well an email pinged my inbox uh, from Christopher Macquarie saying, Get lost, yeah. get out of town. From Christopher Macquarie. He was a big fan. I met him actually. I met him through Simon Pegg and he uh, asked me uh, if if I wanted to be in Mission Impossible. I said, yes, please, I would. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> it's sort of like doing an art house film with a huge budget because because everything is very improvisatory and and very they're hugely encouraging of you to sort of just throw things in and weirdly when the camera some of the camera is like literally right in front of your face it's the most relaxed you could ever be because it's sort of like doing radio you just you just go i'll do that again i'll do another i'll do i'll do 10 do 10 like that all the, all the nerves that you would have from a from the vastness of it kind of vanish because it's just it's just you and the camera you know and, and tom uh was is so welcoming and normal and funny and available on the, on the first the first time last year um i can't remember how this subject came up but we were talking about sort of divas or workplace bullying or something like that he said i tell you who the worst for that is do you know ron howard ron howard happy days howdy doody show i mean and literally everyone's face is just <laughs> He's, I mean, that guy, he, he talked for about 10 minutes and then he just went, oh. <laughs> this is the most brilliant piece of acting I've ever seen. And we, were, we completely fell for it, completely fell for it. Tom Cruise himself, biggest film star in the world, has maintained this for a ludicrous amount of time. A few years ago, somebody, he's, I think he's a little bit older than us, and someone said a few years ago, they said Tom Cruise is now, this is about three years ago, is now the same age as Richard Wilson was when he began <laughs> playing Victor Meldrew. Uh, we, went see, uh, we went to see Cher a few years ago, and oh. that was a great night. And although she, is, she has a delicacy about it, you sort of feel if you grabbed her by the hips, your fingers might go through like sort of like a toffee apple. <laughs> but she, she was brilliant, and she said... Something like, I don't know, she's like 74 or something. She said, uh, I never thought I'd be here at 74 years old. 
But let me ask you this. What's your grandma doing tonight? <laughs> <laughs> um, you, you're super busy. Um, share with the observer what it is that you're leaving us to go and do. This year, uh, I've done another ghost story for Christmas, which is on the 23rd with Jason Watkins. Uh, oh, and, I love Jason. And my, a, rec a recording of The Christmas Carol uh, is on in cinemas and on BBC4 of Christmas. And I am about to leave to go on a ghost hunt with the Reverend Richard Coles on the radio. So it's happened again. I've done a triple again. I couldn't be happier. It's always Christmas in our house, Bob. Tell us uh, uh, quickly where people can go and see uh, Unfriend Unfriended? Unfriended? The Unfriend is at the Criterion in January with right. Gia Smith, Amanda Abington, uh, Francis Barber. Lovely to spend time with you. Thank you, Mark Gaitis. Pleasure. Thank you. Merry Christmas. I've, I've gone like that. And, and even as I was doing it, I thought, what the hell are you doing? I never do this. <laughs>